Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, according to your, uh, you know, geolocalization. Uh, welcome to the Smart Education Summit, which is organized under the theme Reinventing Education in the Metaverse Era. Uh, as you know, COVID-19 pandemic has been an amazing accelerator of the digital transformation of education in most countries around, around the globe. Even skeptical people and organizations about the necessity of such uh, transformation were convinced and even compelled to embrace all kinds of digital technologies, uh, education technologies, ed tech, and innovative pedagogic approaches to ensure the continuity of the teaching and learning activities in the framework of this pandemic. The impact will certainly go on after the pandemic as learners and teachers experimented the wonderful teaching and learning experiences these technologies allow to have, especially with the advent of the metaverse. The metaverse as a game changer is poised to re revolutionize learning and teaching at different levels. The Smart Education uh, Summit will shed light on the different challenges and opportunities in relation with the digi digital transformation of teaching and learning and the main requirements in terms of skills, pedagogical approaches and ed tech to reinvent education in the metaverse era. We have a wonderful lineup of speakers that will address uh, these uh, topics. So uh, I would start with uh, uh, Stephen Downs, who is uh, Dr. Stephen Downs, who is a member of the National Research Council of Canada. So Stephen, you can just uh, share your slides and uh, proceed with your talk. So every speaker will have around 15 minutes for his talk. Thank you. So hello everyone, and I'm assuming you can all hear me just fine. And uh, what I'm here to talk about today is opportunities for education in the metaverse. And uh, again, 15 minutes, there's not a whole lot of time to get into this in great depth, but I do want to introduce this screen here, which is the game no man's sky which is available in 3d i have spent <laughs> thousands of hours in this game i probably shouldn't but i love it so what is the metaverse this is another scene from no man's sky well there's there's a few things that come together to create the metaverse um extended reality virtual reality all of that i'm going to talk a bit about what extended reality and virtual reality are and talk about the different ways and opportunities that they can be used in education and then i'll wrap up with some of the uh, issues uh, and concerns about the technology so we begin with virtual reality virtual reality is a case where users enter a completely virtual world they use uh, a mask or a headset so that they're completely immersed in this environment uh, all sights, sounds, objects are simulated by the computer. Compared to that, we have augmented reality. This is where you're seeing the real world through a see-through viewing device, like, well, there used to be Google Glass, where there's the HoloLens, and there will be others. And then alongside the real world, you see data projected, sort of like a heads-up display. And what this does is it offers more information, typically, about what you are seeing. As well, we have mixed reality. This is blending or merging the virtual and real environment. So you're working probably with a headset. You're manipulating something in virtual reality. But the effect or impact of what you're doing is felt in the real world. So, for example, on the right there, you see a guy manipulating a machine and out there in the world is the real life machine. Uh, we also see this used for, uh, for example, for flying drones or things like that. Extended reality is a term you'll hear a lot. And what it refers to is VR, AR, and MR collectively. And you might be wondering then, what is the metaverse? The metaverse combines all of these XR technologies, and then it adds to it persistent digital objects. And there are different kinds of objects that can be added 
to the real or virtual world, for example, digital currencies such as Bitcoin or Ethereum, digital identities or DIDs, or things like non-fungible tokens, programs, software, etc. There's a whole range of persistent digital objects. So how do we use this in education and learning? Well, one major use is visualization. Small things can be magnified or we can look inside things. Here we see, for example, somebody looking at the inside of a brain through a headset. That's a computer vision and graphics project that we're running here at NRC in Canada. You can also speed up or slow down time. Another thing you can do is interactivity. Interactivity allows for the hands-on manipulation of objects. Uh, here we have an example from the United States where they're manipulating virtual objects, in this case dice, um, and they're using a virtual hand in order to do that. And we, we can see how this could be used to learn how to control machines or devices. It's also useful for the illustration of mechanical or physical principles. And I've seen, for example, uh, you can control the oscillation of digital music by controlling uh, virtual controls. Um, another major use is to create safe environments to learn about things that are inherently dangerous. Flying a plane, for example fighting a fire, working with high voltage equipment. This is a project here and uh, the, the paper is uh, still forthcoming uh, but has been accepted that we're doing at NRC. This is a project that I've personally worked on uh, with the team here at NRC for emergency response training for first responders in cases of uh, accidents or spills involving hazardous materials like gas or methane or ammonia or things like that. And there's a whole range of things that people have to do. So we have a virtual emergency response guidebook, for example, virtual binoculars, and then the scene assessment that you do, etc. Another way that VR, well, the, the, the metaverse generally helps is with accessibility and there's two ways that this plays out first of all it helps people uh, with limited mo mobility or who live in remote regions or who have time constraints where hands-on equipment is not available so it's an excellent tool to assist with accessibility by the same token, and we've seen this quite a bit, it helps people learn how to support people with diverse needs. And, and so you're able to learn, for example, how to work with a mentally challenged person or uh, a physically challenged person to build empathy uh, or to uh, improve cognitive ability. And, and there's an NRC project here. There's a link to a project involving that without actually having to practice on people who have mental or cognitive challenges. Um, and so this makes the, the, the training something that is much more widely accessible. VR, AR and the rest also support remote collaboration. And this is a really exciting area because it allows people to create or manipulate common digital objects. And this is where this whole concept of object persistence comes into play because you are able to know that you and the other person are creating or manipulating the same object. Um, in games like No Man's Sky, we call this multiplayer mode where you have multiple players interacting with the same world. In the case of education and training, uh, we don't call it multiplayer, maybe multi-user mode, um, and we use it for practical educational applications. Uh, illustrated here is a digital circuit design class in Poland where multiple people come in, they're looking at their digital circuit design, 
and uh, of course it's greatly expanded so they can see it and then together they're manipulating the circuits in order to create um, you know uh, integrated circuits <clears throat> An aspect of VR that's useful for education and training is the capability of recording a performance uh, in a virtual environment. These are really useful. First of all, they can be viewed later as an object for discussion, um, or uh, the person who did the action can debrief or go over what they did. And it's not like just taking a a video of a real, uh, physically real performance. In virtual reality, we can see the performance from all angles and all directions. We can zoom in on subtle things. Uh, and then as well, these recordings can be used as learning resources. And so people can access the resource and go into it after to see what was done, say, by an expert in the field. Where the really exciting things happen with the metaverse is when the XR technology and persistent objects are combined with other technologies. And these, this is where the real opportunities will happen. So I'll look at a few of these. First of all, combining it with artificial intelligence. This adds a whole new dimension to virtual reality. First of all, you can get lifelike, immersive environments. I mentioned No Man's Sky a few times. We actually interact with an environment that is AI generated. So we have to have negotiations with creatures, for example, or animals that behave like real animals. In education, we can have smart agents that interact with users that generate tasks or resources, uh, or that make recommendations based on user activities. As well, the artificial intelligence can be used to evaluate learning in the XR environment. Here we have an example of AI-enabled VR tuition, that is instruction in China. Combined with cryptography, uh, in other words, things like digital signatures or blockchain networks, uh, we can create distributed and multi-user virtual environments. So in other words, you don't all go to the same virtual place. You're each in different places looking at a common reality. This supports massive simulations, sporting events, financial markets. Uh, it's the something that the military is very interested in, or we can look at complex global phenomena like climate change. As you can see, we move from just one environment to multiple environments. What's connecting these environments are the individuals and the persistent digital objects. We can also combine VR and AR with real-time data based on real-world models and statistics. For example, imagine a football game or a hockey game is being played in real time. We can actually enjoy watching that game from the perspective of the player or from the perspective of on the ice or on the pitch. Or for learning, we can watch heart surgery from the perspective of the surgeon or the heart in real time as they are actually performing the operation. Combining it with haptics, haptics are feedback devices that give you a sense of touch or feel. Uh, a vibrating controller, for example, is haptics. And these forms of sensory feedback can be used with VR to help you learn skills where the skill is a mechanical or physical skill. Here we have an NRC project that we worked on at NRC called NeuroVR, which trains people how to do brain surgery, specifically removal of tumors, with medical instruments, and you actually feel the resistance of the tumor as you try to eliminate it. 
Now, there are, of course, risks and potential issues with this technology. Uh, first of all, cost is a major factor. Uh, you know, a, a low-cost headset may cost $1,000 Canadian. Um, it also takes a lot of time to learn how to use this technology because you, you need to learn how to manipulate objects in the VR world. It's not something that we grow up learning how to do. Maybe our children, though. There are also health risks. Uh, ergonomic issues are probably the major ones. Repetitive stress injuries. Uh, perhaps nausea or forms of cyber sickness caused by latency issues. That's where you move something and it takes a second for you to see the result on the screen. Or actual physical injury caused by falling or stumbling while using the headset. There are also concerns about bad actors and malpractice. Uh, you know, we can present physical phenomena however we like in the virtual world. And this can lead to people being taught falsehoods about the real world. Uh, there are also cases of inappropriate use um, of surveillance technologies uh, and, and even uh, cases of using virtual world technologies to do things like watch students as they take exams and things like that. And finally, there are social and cultural issues to be considered. Uh, VR is used to help people desensitize themselves to things like fears of spider, but this could also lead to desensitizing other events, and there may be cultural or ethical values that change through virtual world interactions. So that's what I have to present today, and I thank you for your time, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen, for the thought-provoking uh, presentation. Uh, we leave the questions at the end of the presentation, so please stay with us. Thank you so much again for All your right. time. So we'll move to the uh, next uh, talk. To this end, I, I invite, invite the, our next speaker, who's uh, Dr.